Hey guys, it's Joe's Julian. This week, I'm sitting down with co-director of Puss in Boots' Last Wish, Mr. Joel Crawford. During this episode, we chat about his amazing movie in depth, so if you haven't seen it yet, this is your chance to turn around. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Also something you should be checking out is our Patreon channel. We're offering three tiers with a lot of fun perks. Some of those perks included in the three tiers are a special shout out to all the patrons, question priority, early and ad-free access to the audio and video chats, voting on our upcoming retrospectives, and so much more. Now, let's get on to my chat with the great Joel Crawford. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's My Head Podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by Joel. Joel, welcome to the show, man. Uh, thank you. Excited to be here, Julian. I'm excited to be here. Shout out to uh, Bill Ryling for setting this one up. I really appreciate it, Bill. Now, I saved this story. I told Bill ahead of time, and this is how he kind of threw your name out there and said, you got to talk to Joel. Uh, there's a specific scene. Ladies and gentlemen, he directed uh, Puss in Boots Last Witch, which was... I didn't realize that one came out last year. I thought that came out this year. And when I was talking to my buddy Brandon, I was like, man, this is going to win. This is this is one of those movies that's up for title contention for the Oscars. And he was like, I mean, it was last year when it came out. I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I thought this came out lost. this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was like, I thought this one came out last or this year. But nonetheless, man, uh, this movie I've seen at least two to three times maybe even four times a week for a better part of two months, man. Um, and there's a specific scene in this movie that sealed sealed the movie. It was the price of admission, whatever you want to call it. This is the reason that I would go see this movie. Now, I told Bill this story. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a little bit of a sad but cool one. So there is a scene in this Last Wish where Puss starts to have a panic attack. And Perdido comes over, sees this, what's happening, and he lays his head on Puss's, he uh, Puss's chest, right? He, it's his anchor. It brought him back from this devastating panic attack of being chased by by a wolf, by death, right? So a couple years ago, get out of the military. Never really had a panic attack. Never knew what a panic attack was, anxiety, all that bullshit. But once I got out, I started having this existential crisis type of thing like most people do. You don't know if you getting out of the military was a good thing. How am I going to How am I going to survive? How am I going to provide for my family? I'm the only one home. I had just bought this I actually got here her on the call with me right here. This is Ollie, right? That's my oh, dog. That's dog. thank you. Uh, I, I bought her. Uh, she's my best, like goes everywhere with me. Um, so I bought her uh, when I got out of the military in 2016. Uh, and I've always wanted a Husky, right? Balto from Disney cemented the fact that I wanted a Husky, right? Beautiful dogs. And I finally bought one. This is my, you know, get myself something nice when I got out of the military present, right? Get this dog, and this, like I said, the dog's been with me for seven years now. So I'm the only one home a couple years ago, putting the dogs up, um, getting ready to leave somewhere, and then I've been just stressed, work, life, kids, all that shit, right? To a, to a level that I didn't really think I could get to. And then I start to see what horse blinders really were, right? So all I'm starting to see is this tunnel type of thing. All I can see is literally what's in front of me, noticing my heart's beating out of my chest. I notice that I'm not being able to catch my breath. I think I'm having a heart attack. I'm 27, 28 years old. So I, I didn't think I would, thought I was too young to have a heart attack. And I didn't know what was going on. My body is really starting to shut down. My knees are starting to get weak and I'm starting to fall to the floor. And the last thing I think of is this is how I die. I was like, I'm going to have a heart attack. My, my wife's not going to be home for another eight, nine hours. My kid is going to come home from school and find his dad face down on the tile dead. Right. I, that's, I thought that was that. My dog, right? They've got their own room. They've got their own area because huskies are notoriously destructive animals when they're left alone because they get bored. I didn't put her in her room. I didn't shut the gate all the way. She jumped over the gate, put her head on my chest. And you remember that scene in Inception where he would have that little spinning thing and yep, that was what yep. tethered him? Yeah, right. That was what she was for me, right? I put, she laid her head on my chest and I'm sitting here and I could, I could hear her breathing and I could feel her breathing. I could feel her heartbeat and I could touch her for, and like slowly, but surely I started feeling all like all of my sensory factors started coming and I started to be able to touch, I started to be able to see, I started to be able to catch my breath and I could do that with this dog. Right. I go a few years after this happens and I see Puss in Boots. I see that scene. That scene brought me to tears. There's two scenes in particular that I, that I hold like in the highest regard of scenes in this movie. And we'll talk about the other one a little bit later. That scene in particular, man, meant so fucking much to me at 
a time where I forgot about that panic attack, but it brought it back. That scene was so beautiful. How does that scene come about? Oh, I know that's it, a heavy story to throw on you. Know. How would you come up with that scene? But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where where do I jump in? I mean, first of all, I mean that's just that, that touches me just hearing you share your experience with yeah. with an animated <laughs> uh, movie about a talking cat and a talking dog, right? Um, that that it had this connection to you. Um, you know, <clears throat> I uh, well, we, we've got time on this podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if it's okay, maybe we can work into how we discovered we needed that scene in the movie. Absolutely. Um, because really, it, it's every every story, every movie is it's kind of this Rubik's cube of like, how do you tell this story? And uh, when I came on as a director, um, the, you know, Puss in Boots was, it had been over a decade since the first Puss in Boots movie. And, um, <laughs> and we were looking at it going like, okay, they, the studio has been trying to make a sequel to Puss in Boots for so many years. And there's been multiple really talented like writers, directors coming and going adding ingredients at trying to crack what this movie needed to be. Um, one of the constants that I, I didn't come up with, but that has always been there since <clears throat> 10 years ago was this idea that Puss in Boots is a cat on his last of his nine lives. Um, and that has hung around and, and I get why it's when I approached the project, it, it just popped to me. I'm like, that is such a great hook. Um, the problem was, I think it was like, how do you execute this story? Because on the surface, it's so absurd. I don't know where the myth <laughs> that a cat has nine lives, where that even came from, but it's so ridiculous. But as we talked about it, you know, as a, as a team, a, a co-director, Daniel Mercado, Mark Swift, the producer, our writer, Paul Fisher, uh, we, we all were talking about like, what's so poignant about it is, it's really about having one life. It's not about mm -hmm. having nine lives. And when we boiled it down, we're like this, this film has an opportunity to tell a story about the gift we all have as human beings. We have one life to live. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? There's a lot to unpack. And so we kind of set out to, to take this next chapter of Puss in Boots and go, we're going to tell a really ambitious story. That doesn't mean it's going to be, you know, uh, too like heavy and, and like a downer. We want it to be really fun, but, um, you know, it, it was an opportunity to go somewhere new with, with this, um, the, the Shrek world and the Puss in Boots world. Um, I, I think as just to back up a little bit as a, um, I started as a story artist at DreamWorks over like 18 years ago and would board on movies. My first movie is Kung Fu Panda and nice. just got to keep learning and um, working with these really talented directors and writers. Um, and then I was head of story on Trolls. And then I directed my first feature. Well, first I directed a Trolls holiday special, but then my first feature was Crude's A New Age, which was a number two of a movie. <laughs> uh, and then I went on to Puss in Boots 2. And it's interesting being handed though, these giant kind of beloved um, franchises, I guess I'll call them, where there there's these characters that people love. And as a director coming on, you're going, how do I take what people love, but not just make it feel like a studio printing another buck or yeah. make it feel like it's just more of the same. And it's always adding like, what do, what do, what do I want to bring? What do I want to say? And then figure out how to say it. And the unique opportunity on Puss in Boots was it's, it's not only part of, you know, a, a sequel, but it's a spinoff <laughs> from Shrek. So you've got five movies you're building on that you're going, sequels usually keep building out, adding more characters, adding more world. And we saw a unique opportunity in this to go, Puss in Boots started in Shrek 2 as a sidekick that was so funny and essentially stole the show, but we've never seen 
him as a nuanced character. And we had an opportunity to, instead of building out, go inward with the character. And that was our goal with, with Puss in Boots is like, this, everybody knows him as this heroic cat and he's always joking and, and kind of being fearless. And we saw him as a, as a superhero. And the, the best superheroes have, have vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And we've never been able to see that. And in our early conversations with Antonio Banderas, we were pitching him this story. And we we're really excited to go, hey, we're going to show that, the, you know, this 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 persona of his is, is this shield where he doesn't admit vulnerability. And this is going to be a journey that is going to force him to um, show that he actually does feel fear, just like everyone else and and experiences this um you know the the state of mortality and and mm -hmm. antonio got so excited he was he was he said you know this was in probably 2021 when we we're having this conversation and like early in the year and we we're still in kind of the middle of the pandemic and antonio was he was like you know people have lived with so much death and not talking about adults, you know, kids have experienced yeah. this. And to actually create something that um, doesn't shy away from that, but makes it accessible for conversations. And he's like, the only constant, you know, in life is that it will end. <laughs> yeah. And um, and being able to take a, a bold stance of going, we're going to tell this story for everybody we're not telling we're not making a kids movie we're not making a movie that's just only for adults we're making this for everybody and really from the beginning there as a whole team we set out with that as our kind of okay this is what we're going to do <laughs> now how are yeah. we going to do it um and i'm sorry i don't want to just keep rambling i i am getting oh no you're perfectly the, fine um the uh, it, it was an ambitious task to go we're gonna <laughs> tell a story that isn't as much about death but more about celebrating life mm -hmm. and what we need to to accomplish that is it needs to be this kind of roller coaster ride that isn't just laughter and fun and jokes about um, about this topic it we need to actually experience you've got to you've got to go into the dark to feel the light yes and and um you know, I'm actually really grateful the studio, uh, they were 100% with us of, of like, we're, we're making a comedy, but it's a comedy about death. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's going to explore some some challenging themes. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that they didn't shy away from that. They trusted us to, to, you know, deliver that. But as we boiled it down, the reason we discovered we needed that panic attack scene was in one of our first times of you know every every few months we storyboard the movie we put it up and we screen it and it has temporary voices temporary music and these drawings are kind of like a comic book version of the whole movie that allows you to just see the flow of it and see what's working and what's not mm -hmm. and then whatever's not working we, re we rewrite we re storyboard um and when we put the movie up for the first time it was fun and we even knew where Puss was going to end up, but his journey felt forced. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel real because we weren't just building on this movie, starting out with him. He's fighting a giant. He's yeah. showing no fear. For this guy to, you know, ask for help, he's had, you know, <laughs> four other movies that have also shown him as this kind of cavalier, um, you know, kind of swashbuckling hero. And mm -hmm. so we we quickly discovered, we're like, that guy's not gonna ask for help. It felt so contrived when we had him you know, asking Kitty softpaws and, and admitting flaw. And so yeah. it really became this journey of us going, forget this is an animated movie. Forget this is a movie. In in our lives, what are the shields we put up that that are either our ego, our facade of that hide things we're afraid of, or just what we think we are, what our identity is. Mm -hmm. And for us, we said, 
Well, he he's a cat who wears boots. So we have we have boots, we have the hat, and we have a sword. Mm. And even the very first time the wolf shows up in the bar, he names all all these things. He's as he's talking about him, yes. talking about the, this persona, which Puss is very proud of. And then what does he do in the bar? He he disarms him and Puss runs away and he loses one of it, his most important thing that is his identity, his sword. And so really we discovered this, this movie was a journey of stripping away all of the shields that Puss has always had to protect him from having to admit that he's vulnerable just like everyone else. And once we kind of, and even, even in the beginning of the movie, once Puss retires, <laughs> yeah. he goes to uh, Mama Luna's house for Old cats. Pickles. And, <laughs> because Pickles, he loses his <laughs> name, right? And then yes. everything we're like, we're gonna tell it in a, in a fun, joyful way, but there's meaning in every single thing that we're doing. And having him grow a beard was this this thing where it becomes like a baby step. It's actually the first thing he he kind of asks for help with. He says it's itchy, and he asks Kitty Softpaws to help him cut it because he doesn't have a sword, and she has mm -hmm. hers. Um, so it's like these baby steps of how do we believably inch this character toward admitting he is afraid for his own life, and he hasn't been perfect, and so. But by the time we get to where the panic attack is, we, in the first screening, we didn't have that. And it felt like, man, we we're taking away these things from him. You know, oh, do we take his boots? Do we take his hats? And we're like, no, we're thinking too literal. It's what are you left with once you're, you lose that, the, the surface level kind of identity of, of mm -hmm. a job of, of your name of all these things that are more surface level it's the senses it's he he is so filled with fear that he he can't hear he only hears his shallow breath everything gets kind of warbly and he loses the ability to see he has blurred vision and he can't even move he's like paralyzed with fear yes and once we remove all those things we only left him with one sense and that was the touch because this movie in our big kind of mantra we're like this is a story of connection that we need connections and that's what makes life meaningful and so in a very literal way the time he needs it the most we disarmed him he's not asking for help but he has to accept it and mm -hmm. perito steps in and just like you shared really impactfully that the placing of the head on the stomach is it what we later found out is a term called grounding yes that focusing on one sense which we didn't know when we were we we're just trying to be authentic to the moment um but that this brings him back into mm -hmm. slows down his breathing and then his vision comes back and then he's able to have experienced what admitting vulnerability can do and he and he feels and so um we kind of organically found that that panic attack because when it was missing it felt fake yeah that makes sense and i'm glad you broke that down man it it like i said there there's so many things that you can draw from from this movie that in my opinion I'm not just blowing smoke. It's a perfect movie from start to finish. Like I said, most parents, once they hit the toddler stage of like kids watching movies, it's the same movie seven, eight, nine, ten times a day, man. I I, th I thoroughly look forward to watching this one every day now. I'm watching oh. this one. I'm watching <laughs> Trolls. Uh, Super Mario Brothers is another one that's in rotation. Um, and then he's been deep diving in Toy Story. Um, Some however, day. However, I will say that he is a he's a Disney kid, but he's for sure a DreamWorks kid because Boss Baby has been one of those <laughs> movies where if he, like if we're burnt out of everything and we just went through the phase of like six straight weeks of Boss Baby. Um, and it's funny, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Boss Baby. We'll get back to Puss and Boots for just a second and in just a second. But uh, we, we were trying to figure out why he kept calling his pacifier a Bobo 
right? And there's this, I'm sitting upstairs or I'm sitting downstairs, excuse me. I'm watching it with him in the office. We're eating some snacks and stuff like that. And um, I've got him sitting in my lap and then he's just vegging out because he just woke up from a nap. So we're sitting there and then it's the scene where um, Boss Baby is trying to get Tim to suck on the pacifier. And then he's explaining to him the origin story of the pacifier. He's like, it goes by many names. And he said, Bobo. And I'm like, holy shit, this is how he this is how he named his pacifier, Bobo. And I call Katie, and that's my wife's name. I was like, hey, come in here real quick. And she's like, I don't want to watch Boss Baby anymore. I've watched it enough. I was like, no, no, no. This is very important scientific research right here. So I rewound it 10 seconds. And I was like, listen and tell me what you hear. And then she listened. She's like, I didn't hear anything. I was like, he said Bobo. He says Bobo. He learned this from this movie. <laughs> he is picking up everything. So we have a we have a five month old too. He would take the pacifier out of her mouth and then put it into his. And we used to think it was just like one of those things where it's like, oh, he's jealous or whatever it is. Same thing. I'm watching this movie. And I look up and they do that. That the, the, he goes and he puts it in the the older kid's mouth, Tim's oh. mouth, and I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> this kid is absorbing everything through cinema, and he's learning stuff. So I've had to be like really cognizant of like what we're watching and when he's around <laughs> and stuff because I don't want him doing shit he's not supposed to do. Um, but going back to going back to Puss in Boots, man, there were so many things that you hit on that I, I wanted to, to circle back to. Like I said, that panic attack scene worth the price of admission. There's another thing that's worth the price of admission. And that is the one of the three villains in this movie, the wolf. And for the life of me, it's he's his name is slipping my 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 head right now. Who's the, the actor? actor that did? Yeah, who's the actor oh, that did the wolf? Uh, Wagner Mora, uh, spelled like Wagner, uh, Brazilian guy, uh, most talented and also just sweetest human being. Um, and we we're fortunate to to get him as part of this. That. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Greatest villain in the last 10 years that I've seen in any movie, any comic book, any cartoon, any animated, anything. Best villain. Because usually in any movie that I've seen in the last decade, what do they do with villains? They make you feel for the villain. Like, oh, he's got a tragic backstory. His mom yelled at him. His dad was this. Like, no, just give me a dude that's that's evil. That's all I need. Just give me a dude that has no other ulterior motives. Nobody yelled at him. Nobody made him cry. Nobody spilt milk on him when he was a kindergarten. He's just an evil guy. He's death reincarnate. He is the uh, he is the epitome of death. He is a wolf, right? And everything from before he enters the scene with that haunting whistle, that whistle, where did that come from? Like just him entering the scene and that whistle comes about. Yeah, you know, uh, it was a fun evolution with that wolf character. Um, the But the, specifically with that, that whistle, so the co-director, Daniel Mercado and I, were uh, huge uh, Sergio Leone fans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about you know, when we were working with the composer, Hector Pereira, um, very talented, amazing guy that we, we wanted something that um, we were referencing once upon a time in the West. Yes. Um, and the, in that movie, um, there is a harmonica that this, this melody that's played and it's the melody keeps coming back throughout that movie. The melody never changes but your relationship with that melody changes once you learn more about it and mm -hmm. and there's something haunting about it so we kind of gave that task to the the composer we were like we want this to sound um like it doesn't have to actually be the super menacing sound but once you meet the wolf and you've heard this sound you equate them yes we kind of compared it also to um like lightning and thunder mm -hmm. where using both of those senses where you go yeah. when when you see <laughs> then you, and you hear yes. it's like the combination is terrifying right yeah how close is it and so that was the the task we gave to hate and well the cool thing is it, it i thought we were going to be going round and round finding the perfect thing it it when he played it for us we're like this is perfect because it there's a mocking quality in it that feels like it it's it has this nursery rhyme kind of mm -hmm. feel at least for me and it's subjective but um it so it's it becomes creepier and creepier when you realize that this wolf isn't a bounty hunter yeah. <laughs> um and that he is relentlessly pursuing puss 
and that he's a force of nature and that he is ultimately death. And so <laughs> um, that was kind of the genesis of, of that, that uh, sonic quality to the wolf. Yeah, it, it every time, like I said, best villain in the last decade, anytime that whistle would happen, like the same thing that happened to Puss, man, like the, the hair kind of stands up on the back of your neck. You're like, I don't feel comfortable, man. I, this, is, this is a little too close to home. But that whole opening sequence, when you meet him in the bar, it's just... Like I said, you got you guys nailed. Like if you wanted a creepy villain, a creepy like death, right? Because I didn't get it until about halfway through. Um, and if we're being honest, and I probably didn't get it until he's like, no, "I'm death." Essentially, he's like, "I'm death at the end of the movie" type of thing. Um, but that first that first sequence, we see them, you know, interacting, and he pulls out that that dead or alive, and he starts tapping. And it was just like I said, I've never seen a villain quite like him probably in a very very long time I, like i'm drawing a blank now if, if i can try to draw any comparisons to a, a villain that i've seen like this one he was very unique um his his whole get up was just really cool too i love the eyes like what you guys did with the eyes especially in the scene when puss is leaving after they take the map from um uh jack big jack um and it's just you see the silhouette you see him in the shadows and then you just see two red beady eyes you're like damn this is dark for a kids movie, man. Uh, was there any kind of <laughs> was there any kind of pushback on the design, or did they have to tell you to soften him up at all uh, over at DreamWorks? You know that was our our concern, and I'll talk about like we um, when we set out to like we were we were even as you're trying to figure out the story, we worked really quickly on this movie, and so mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out frantically what are the perfect ingredients and knowing we have a lot of characters to service and we want to make sure everybody has a purpose in the movie. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of this is the, the process that myself, the producer, Mark Swift, our process, we love just communicating with the studio instead mm -hmm. of like trying to slip stuff by. It's like, yeah, because it, it, the notes will come up later. And so mm -hmm. we try and be very clear about like why we're doing something. And then if we can agree on the need for it, then it's about execution if they have notes. Um, because we all agreed on this is Puss's journey to overcome this, this fear uh, of death and mm -hmm. to really celebrate life. Um, we realized we needed the wolf as he, he affects nobody else in the story. He's, he's a, he's just a personal villain or antagonist for Puss in Boots. And really in the first few passes where we were storyboarding that, um, that bar scene where he, where the wolf shows up, we didn't feel that he was menacing enough mm -hmm. because Puss in Boots is such a, a egotistical character that it was like, man, I just, I don't feel like he's going to be afraid. I just saw him take down a giant, right? Like yeah. what's going to really strike fear into him? And um, we kept, um, myself and the co-director kept just quickly reboarding stuff, taking a picture with our phone and the editor would cut it in in real time. We would just keep reworking stuff in editorial. And we realized we needed to almost use a lot of the uh, spaghetti Western <laughs> techniques yeah. of, you know, use that massive close-up of, of the eyes, but to hit a really strong story point, the moment Puss gets cut, you know, he sings in the mm. beginning, bragging about how he's never been touched by a blade. Yes. And we, we retroactively, once we found this moment, we actually worked backwards and put that into the, the opening so that we could set up his arrogance. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are like, this is the moment when we have to show blood coming down his head because even though it's just a drop, this is so impactful. This shatters his world. He yes. is mortal. And once we found that, it was this process of like, okay, cool. We know what, why the scenes in the movie and we're feeling it. And then the editor, uh, Jim Ryan, he, he was like, I, I want to see his lives flash before his eyes. And he quickly mocked up from, Puss in Boots, the first Puss in Boots, he grabbed stills from it and just cut them. And that's the cool thing with, with animation. It's very collaborative. You're mm -hmm. all trying to work toward like, how do we solve this? And 
he quickly put that in there where it was just these flashes of previous lives. And then you have this, this setting of like feeling fear for the first time. And then just how can you show it, not tell it. Right. And it, just seeing that, wow, he's feeling fear and going, no, 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 I can't, I can't let go of life. I need life. Yes. Um, and once uh, the, the irony with that scene was, uh, when I came onto the movie, I pitched to the studio that yes, this is about death, but it's going to be a big comedy. And we were moving so fast that that was actually the first scene we showed to the studio after I came on that we, we were like, we realized the irony in this, that I pitched you a big comedy and this scene is not funny. Yeah. <laughs> this scene. And, but, but then we said, but the reason for this scene is to actually anchor the entire movie. The reason I think this for so many years, they were trying to unlock what the story should be is it's an absurd movie about a cat on his ninth life until you go, oh, wait, that's me. I have one life. And this that was the pivotal moment where when Puss bleeds and he feels fear, I think the audience comes into this movie going, oh, another animated movie. And then going, holy crap, yeah. what's this feeling? I did not expect this. And I think there's something so um, essential in lining up the audience reaction with the character's reaction. So that mm -hmm. they're feeling shock. And it's not just yeah. shock for the for the sake of going, oh, look at what we did. But it's like that emotional thing, I think from there on, then people are like, oh, what's going to happen? And yeah. um, and the, the studio, when we showed them the scene, it was super rough storyboards, even some stuff that was taped together because we would draw on random pieces <laughs> of paper, take pictures. It's so sloppy. Um, it, back to the trust of the studio. When we when we showed them this the scene cut together, um, they said it's effective, like it works. Mm -hmm. They're like, it may be going too far, but we'll wait till we do the preview screenings. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, as as you're finishing up the movie, you do these screenings with like 300 people. That kind of it's like a focus group that gives their honest reaction. Um, they said, well, well, we'll see how it tests, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing was the movie doesn't end with that. <laughs> it ends on a <laughs> joyful note. So when an audience watches it, they get this roller coaster ride. Yeah, they go mm -hmm. down there, but they're up leaving. And so they were actually celebrating the theme <laughs> by the end of the movie. So that, in a way, gave the studio confidence going, wow, this is working. Um, mm -hmm. So really grateful we, we kind of were able to uh, first just take those big swings and that the studio allowed us, you know, allowed that to live and, and see how it, it works in the, in the bigger picture. Dude, beautiful. Uh, I mean, like I said, it, it, it's, it's weird. Um, Cause that was that first scene that, or that scene you were talking about where he finally gets cut. I never thought about it until you, until you explained it, but linking up the audience with the character that was, when I when I turned this movie on, I was like, "All right, I've never seen a Puss in Boots movie. I've seen Shrek though. I grew up with Shrek. I know Shrek. This is going to be probably this kind of movie." And that scene hits, and it was even the scene before then when Puss comes out at Wolf, and then Wolf catches him by the throat, and he's like, "You're not living up to the legend." I'm like, "This uh, this guy seems like he's a little bit on par for our hero here, you know? Because when you think of Puss in Boots, like nobody nobody messed with him in any of the Shrek movies. Like he was like." He was your ace up your sleeve type of thing. He was the guy break glass in case of type of guy. And you see him going blow for blow. I'm like, he just beat a giant to death or he killed a giant. I was like, and he's losing to a wolf. I'm like, what's going on here? And then as the movie goes on, you start to see that that story kind of build out. Um, and I didn't want to spend the uh, the entire time on the wolf power, but like I said, best character or not a best character, but the best villain last 10 years for any movie. Um <laughs> This the scene in particular, like I said, where where he catches him, he gets in real close, and you were talking about that pan up or the spaghetti westerns where they would focus in on the eyes. It's I'm always blown away by what you guys can what you guys can do with a shot like that, where you don't see anything other than the eyes. You might see a little bit of the background, but you can tell everything, the character's motivation, what's really driving that character to do whatever he's supposed to do with that one shot in his eyes, and it just it looks different 
right? Um, was that, I noticed you said that it was a, uh, you know, a lot of spaghetti Western influence, but was that a concerted effort at the beginning to do a lot of those close ups to see something like that? Um, it's always that thing where you're as filmmakers, you're inspired by mm -hmm. plenty of, of, in, uh, of other of films and you kind of go, oh, it's, it's like that. And that's, you kind of develop your vocabulary. Yeah. Um, the, I think what we're finding is when you you have your inspirations, I mean, for, for myself and Janual, the, our inspirations go, they range from, um, <laughs> they range from like the uh, Sergio Leone, Akira Kurosawa, which are very yeah. connected, which Kurosawa inspired so many uh, with the samurai. Mm -hmm. um, and then they go into the Lonely Island Boys, the the like MacGruber, uh, Mike Judge, uh, Idiocracy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the Lord and Miller, like Twenty One Jump Street. Like we have this, it's just this weird kind of mashup where one second we'll be talking about, you know, the the shot from Yojimbo, you know, Kurosawa, like oh he did this, and they were like, and we're like oh remember in MacGruber when, and we just like you go on a, a but. Um, you kind of use those as your it, it's your vocabulary between each other um mm -hmm. but what's cool about that is it's like this snowball that as you know these animated movies there's like 300 400 people on the crew by the time yeah. you're finishing up and you're trying to as a director have everybody have the same vision to know as it goes down the pipeline uh, that you're trying to make sure everybody is contributing not just you know doing what was intended but like plussing it and mm -hmm. uh, Nate Rag, the production designer, building off of Daniel and I going, hey, we really want this this bar scene to feel like a Sergio Leone and not a spoof. We're not going like in a Western kind of parody way. Yeah. We want this to have that that quiet, that still, that kind of surprises you. Um, and so the, the filmmaking becomes very stylized in that way. Um, off of that, the Nate went to, you know, the the opening credits of, um, of the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, where you get mm -hmm. those flat cards, right? That those flat yeah. graphics, and they're they're these bold colors, reds, yellows, you know, and um, and that actually inspired the moment where when Puss gets cut right before that close up you're talking about of the eyes, mm -hmm. that the entire backdrop background drops to red and in that kind of thing where that was the inspiration was the good bad and the ugly but it became this new thing and in what nate very uh, cleverly did was he's like you want the audience to feel the punch of this little red bead of blood yes. to do that we're not going to have any red like heavy reds in the scene up until we just wash the audience with one bullet time slow-mo where the mm -hmm. whole background goes boldly to red and what happens your eye goes red and then the very next shot there's no red and then the blood runs down and your eye like hyper fixates on yes. that and it, it's it's i mean it's what i love about film it's like you put all these 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 creative people together and you go what are we saying and they find so many clever ways to say it and so um it's just this uh, really fun process that I often equate to, to improv. Um, yeah. I, I, while I was at Cal Arts, I went down to Groundlings Improv during the summer and took, you know, acting classes. Just because I, I, I fell in love with the spontaneous nature of, like, finding things out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And um, I like to, in a way, direct the movies that way too. Where you're going. We know where we're going, but we don't know how we're going to get there. <laughs> and that's, it's scary, but it's fun. <laughs> I could imagine. Uh, before we, before we rotate off of the wolf, there was one more scene in particular. And I talked, I think I might've talked to Bill about this one too. Um, I put this one up there with 101 Dalmatians. There's a, there's a scene in there with 101 Dalmatians where Jasper and Horace have all the puppies it's towards the end of the movie. Spoiler alert, if, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen this movie, uh, everybody makes it out except Corolla the villain, Jasper and Horace. Um, but uh, the scene in the mansion in the DeVille mansion where they've, got all of the puppies in there and then Horace and Jasper are about to start clubbing them right before Pongo and Perdita. That was another movie. My son just consistently watched on repeat too. jump through the window right before then 
you see it and it's the whole background goes red. Horace has got the thing above his head. You see Sergeant Tibbs and Sergeant Tibbs putting his arms out and all the puppies. He's trying to protect all of the puppies, right? Everything goes red. If you freeze that frame right there in that scene, you can tell everything you need to know with not one word uttered. You can just see the, the complete fear and panic on Sergeant Tibbs' face as well as those dogs' faces, right? You know what's going to happen. You, your mind can tell you everything you need. You don't need any dialogue. That scene right there, I think, is one of the... I think it's probably the best scene in any Disney movie I've ever seen. I don't know why. I, I think it may be just the color. I don't know what it is. It was just it was, it was a masterpiece, really. The scene in Puss in Boots that I put that one next to is the scene where um, Puss is in there talking and reminiscing about all of his previous lives. He's in there, uh, like the glass cave or the cavern, where it kind of has right. that... Um, that that mirror for a uh, what are those things called like a carnival thing where you go in there and you see all the mirrors oh, yeah, and sports yeah. everything it's got house that vibe to it right thing, yeah house of mirrors thank you um i don't know why i brain farted on that one but it happened uh but <laughs> nonetheless he's in there and he's seeing it and then the wolf comes in and the wolf starts chasing him out i just happened to look up the first time i watched it everything goes red and the wolf is on every every panel every pane of glass that's in there and i'm like holy shit I don't know if this is a direct correlation or a direct inspiration from 101 Dalmatians, but that's the vibe I took from it. Like that scene and the 101 Dalmatians scene, I hold them in the same category as like a fantastic and masterful scene. Um, do you remember how that one kind of came about? Just that whole, he's going to plaster every picture and he's chasing puss out of there? Well, first of all, that, that's a huge honor to be <laughs> compared to, <laughs> you know, something like that classic Um you know, uh, again, with animation, what's cool is that as things go down to touch different, like people are going, like in lighting, they came up with that, everything going red right there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if there was a, a direct correlation with 101 Dalmatians. Yeah. The artist who came up with the idea may have been inspired very likely, like we're all such animation fans. Yeah. Um, but that, and that's the thing as a director where I'm like, my job is just to know, know what the movie's about and know mm -hmm. how we're going to say it. And, yeah. and really kind of be open to what, what's our vocabulary and mm -hmm. Nate finding the splash of red in that opening bar allowed for it was one of the lighters that um, said, you know, what, what if, um, yeah, Pablo, he, he, he was like, what if we, you know, went all red again, being inspired by the early scene. And so yeah. it's, I guess that's a vocabulary now we've established for, for the wolf and um, being able to see him. It was, it was like, how do you, the wolf is so scary. It was like, how do we keep maximizing his, uh, he's always chasing puss. Mm -hmm. And so I remember from the storyboards, we had those reflections in there. We didn't have the red. That was an additional idea, but um, we wanted it to be this. I, I'm, I'm such a geek where I'm like, I love metaphors, right? That, <laughs> um, and, and puss is like literally just running from death. Death mm -hmm. is always on his heels, right? In the cave of Lost Souls, uh, where all the reflections are, death actually reveals, or the wolf reveals, he's not a bounty hunter, he's actually I'm death. death. And so we knew we needed to level up Puss's perception of the wolf. So he can no longer just be following, but that like having reflections all like death mm -hmm. is all around me. I can't escape it. And there's a little light <laughs> tunnel that he's running towards. Um, that that was kind of our thing is like let's turn this up and we gave that um the to the lighting team we're like this is the feel we want that he it, that's all around him then they're like well what if that's all around him and it's red and super stylized um mm -hmm. and then our animation team is like and what if we drop the frames and we go back to stepped animation while he's running and it just everything feels hyper yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> I loved, I had a, I had a guy on that was a visual, uh, I think his, his title was visual developer. It might be something else. It's something visual, but he did a lot of work on um, the last Spider-Man movie, uh, Across the Spider-Verse, 
Um, he did Into the Spider Verse. Um, if you've seen that one, he did the he's the guy that came up with a lot of the stuff for Gwen's World. So developing Gwen's World and everything, which was my oh, favorite awesome. part of the entire movie. And I asked him this question. I'm going to ask you, and uh, I hope you can give me an answer for it. Um, but with how Spider Verse is and how Puss in Boots is, like I draw those two correlations because you guys have a lot of the same. I don't want to say style, but it's a lot of, I called it mixed media and he just called it animation. He was like, dude, it's just animation. He's like, you got stop motion. You got this, you got that, you got this. And he's like, at the end of the day, a blanket of statement is all animation, but I'm starting to see in so many movies. And I think it's one of the coolest things in the world is like, it's not traditional animation anymore. It's like you guys are pushing the boundaries of what can be done within animation. And I find it so fun and so fascinating because it's like, you saw it in the Mitchells versus the machines too. this, like you'll yeah. see you know, push run and you'll see click clack click clack or you see the things coming off as and then everything goes very choppy not in a bad way but like choppy like it was stop motion and then it goes back to that 3d style is there a name for like this style of movie or this style of animation that's coming out now so the interesting thing and then and you and i right before this we're talking about ninja turtles right yes and how cool that is and um absolutely it's such an exciting time um that it's interesting. Yes, like Spider Verse really kind of kicked the doors open for mm -hmm. the mainstream um, Western animation. You know, like the, the the big Hollywood movies. Yes. Kicking the doors open, going movie animated movies don't have to just look CG. Um, mm -hmm. But to the point of like all these animation styles have been around for so long, um, and and uh, you know Japanese animation. Yes. has always been innovating and and really a lot of these techniques come from japanese like the, from anime um it we call it stepped animation that um because in the in the traditional kind of whether it was hand-drawn animation or cg that you know 24 frames a second and each frame is its own image and so there's this everything is moving smoothly and mm -hmm. and there's like a fluidity that feels more grounded even though it's pushed animation um the stepped animation is when you're holding one drawing but for instead of just one frame for two three four yeah. six eight frames and what happens is um you it's a different feeling it doesn't feel as grounded it feels fantastical mm -hmm. and and your eye is able to see the and we used it um in a way of exaggerating the points uh the story points throughout the movie for us we said like we're going to use this tool of stepped animation when it's necessary we're not going to do it just because it's cool but yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to use it really to tell the point of view of puss in boots who thinks he's immortal doesn't fear anything at the beginning and all of the action we're like what if the action feels like you're in a superhero movie like it mm -hmm. feels fantastical doesn't feel grounded and that was one of our big points in the opening where puss is fighting the giant that wanted to use the the stepped animation where he's jumping and dodging the bell and yeah. you can see he's like hanging in the air like there, it's not on ones it's it's held for a while and it feels like like a superhero it feels you're, as the audience, you're not feeling fear. Again, lining up the emotion of the audience with Puss Boots. And we have these big swooping cameras that are smooth. And those are all like, you're 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 on pretty much his cape, right? You feel yeah. like, oh, Superman's got me. It's cool. Yeah. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> and and um, I think the coolest thing in the industry right now is that as filmmakers, it's like we've we've with all the CG movies, even going back to the first Shrek, there was this, this, everybody was chasing photorealism, like, oh, mm -hmm. CG can, look at all the hairs on their arms, look at all the freckles, and like, it was yeah. trying to, to emulate real life, and animation can do so much more and be more impressionistic, mm -hmm. um, but with, with mainstream kind of uh, animated features having to look all CG, it's limiting the tools that y you as a filmmaker you're you're trying to tell a story but you have less words to tell it with 
And then, so it's like you're just having a Sharpie and going, draw me the picture that describes this story. And and then once Spider-Verse came along and was showed that audiences not only will accept unique styles, but actually crave things mm -hmm. to be unique and more specific. Um, and when studios saw that, they're like, yeah, make, you know, fit, do the style that, that works for the movie. Now as a filmmaker, I feel like, oh, I've, I don't have just a Sharpie, you know, I can, yeah. I can, I have a pencil, I have a, a watercolor brush, I have this and that. And you're going, you can add this nuance that so feels so specific to the story and the thing you're trying to say. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, it's I, just sitting in the theater, watching Ninja Turtles recently, watching Spider-Verse, um, so many things where I'm like, I'm just like this, you know, a theater full of people watching this movie and I'll put, put some boots in with that, where the animation style that used to be considered like more uh, indie <laughs> or mm -hmm. experimental is now like being celebrated. Mainstream. Yeah. yeah. And it's such an exciting thing. Um, because for me, it's, it's not about it just looking different, but I think with animation, it's been put in a box for so long um, that it's like, oh, animated movies can only ha tackle these subjects because they're for kids. And like I was saying earlier, is we never set out to make a movie for kids. We made, mm -hmm. we made a movie for everybody. Um, but that going, not only can these movies look one way, they can also tell different stories, challenging themes that um, you're not used to seeing <laughs> tackled in yeah. such a way, such as a panic attack. Yes it's like what you guys were able to do and you 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 unlock something for me when you were breaking that down you guys used to have just that eight crayon box back in the day when it came to animation now you guys are on the 64 124 with the sharpener on the back man with you the guys sharpener on the side with yeah. the sharpener on the back man you know what i mean so <laughs> you guys really unlocked all the tools I, like i said i love the style because there's so many scenes in there that it felt like because i'm a huge comic book guy too so i go and get my comic books every wednesday you know so it felt like a comic book movies and some of those scenes where you, you called it stepped animation it was like it felt like i was watching panel by panel of a superhero going through his day to days man and and what i liked about this is you didn't show puss in boots just vanquishing this guy or just beating this guy you saw him getting thrown through a wall you saw him getting slung you saw him getting cut you saw everything that you know most of the time you don't see about heroes i like comic books and, and movie shows where it's it's not grounded in a sense where it has to be real but grounded in a sense is like oh that dude had to go out and get milk and eggs because he has to eat too he's not just out here punching the joker or punching the riddler you know what i mean he's got real yeah. shit to do on a day-to-day -day basis you know that's what i liked about puss in boots because it felt even though it was it was fake you know it felt real in a sense like this is really what would happen if somebody was really focusing on his last life he was going through the the doldrums of life right you know he's he's had eight before what's another one and then he comes to find out like no when this one's gone man you're you cease to exist and you start seeing that change the evolution you gave you know i'm gonna take a quote from shrek man you gave puss and boots layers man you, you you made them that onion that shrek was talking about you know you keep peeling back one and by the time you get to the ninth one you're like oh wow this guy's really changed he's really cool and i'd be remiss not to to bring up a couple of those other villains i'm always amazed when you guys can weave in how you weave in multiple stories and not one overshadows every single one of them enhances each other and then you guys pay it all off in the end i mean you guys had like i said the wolf you had goldilocks and the three bears you had you know big jack was a horner warner yes horner, horner you know, yep um you know how you guys tied in all three of these they were all chasing the same thing but each one of them had a different reason for chasing this last wish you know goldie wanting to you know find a family and not realizing the family was her bears the ones that raised her um you know jack just you know, he was just a dick, man. He wanted complete and utter control of everything magical because, you know, he was outstaged <laughs> by uh, by the Muppet. You know what I mean? So, um, well, we, and, I mean, to, to that point, um, you know, early on, I'd mentioned like how we were going, why, we, we can't just have a bunch of characters. Mm -hmm. We have to have a purpose for every single one. And we're telling this ambitious story about 
what makes life meaningful and worth celebrating. And um, I got to hand it to a lot of our cast, the, the actors, um, in conversations with them, it became really about appreciating what you have. John Mulaney mm -hmm. was one of the first to point this out when I was pitching the character to him, that uh, it's funny because Jack Horner is this, he, 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 John was fixing, he's like, he wants all the magic in the world. Like, like, is it, he, he, he went on this like long riff. He's the funniest guy. He was like, he's like, it's like the guy who swears if he, if he only has a pizza oven in his backyard, he'll like, that, that his life will be complete, complete you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll use it every weekend, I swear. And, but he really tapped into this thing of like, this is a guy who's searching for an external happiness to fill this internal void. Yeah. And and he'll never get it, and um, in and then Florence Pugh in conversations with her Selma Hayek, we we really involved the actors in our writing process and even just improvising in sessions, and what happened was we realized each character is a different expression of the theme, and that's why I think the movie has this cohesion because mm -hmm. it's tackling the idea of like you get one life. How are you going to be happy with it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Puss in Boots, it, it's, it's not enough for him, right? He, he wants, he essentially wants immortality. So yeah. he can't appreciate what he already has been given. Kitty can't appreciate that she has somebody to trust. Um, Goldie doesn't appreciate that she already has a family. Mm -hmm. And then, then uh, Jack Horner, he he's like the, the ultimate... And what was so fun about him is like, this guy is not going to have an arc. He is not no. going to learn a damn thing. He, <laughs> and, but it was, he still has a purpose, but he's the, the kind of cartoony version of the theme, which is like, I, it's never enough. I want everything. And mm -hmm. we paired it with Jiminy Cricket to even draw that contrast. Um, but, but by doing that, like it, you get this kind of nuanced exploration of the theme of gratitude. Yeah. I I'm I'm so glad cuz you brought up the cricket and <laughs> one of my one of my favorite scenes is just him uh Jack just going in before he sets him free gives him this whole he's like this diabolical thing. He's like, "No, nah, I don't I don't I'm not really a locust. I just I I just tell people what they feel or what they should feel." But like as it progresses through and then the the Jiminy essentially sees Jack just this evil dude for like no reason and then he just looks at him he's you're a monster he, like his voice changes the tone changes this splash page I think it's like yellow and orange it's just like it's it lights up really bright it was it was just one of those com I love seeing just the back and forth with those two characters if there was a buddy cop show that I could make it happen just snap my fingers if I had DreamWorks money I'd say give me cricket and give me Jack buddy cop movie because that's what I want to see next um, <laughs> I love hearing that because it, yeah. <laughs> we um, that was a, a a late kind of addition as well we had Jack Horner figured out and we always mm -hmm. had his henchman that he was talking to but it just it came off as exposition because it was like it wasn't meaningful enough because he didn't care about them and we were trying to we were like we have the devil this comedic devil in a scene <laughs> we need an angel and for a while like with our writer Paul Fisher we were like is there any way we could get the dog, you know, Perito kidnapped and by Jack Horner, then we could get those two together. And we we're like, the story cannot support. Perito has so much work to do. Mm -hmm. um, talking about he's, he's the, he is the ultimate manifestation of the theme of gratitude. He wants, he's nothing. the soul of the movie. Yeah. yeah, he really is. And, and so it was so important that he spend time with not only Puss and Kitty, but also Goldie to help her transformation. And, and, um, Paul Fisher, we were in this this kind of writer's room brainstorm thing, and and he's like, he's like, what about Jiminy Cricket? Like that guy is the ultimate. And and we were like, at this point in the process, I mean, we were moving so fast on this movie. We were told we, we cannot design any more characters. We had like just finishing this movie was a challenge enough. And mm -hmm. um, but then like to Paul's credit, like we kept we we kind of said no to it as we kept talking and trying to solve. And he goes, guys, no, 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 seriously. And he and he's the Paul is super funny. And he pitched on this. And then as we talked, we we're like, 
what is the voice of this goody two shoes guy? And our brains went to um, the super old reference here, but Frank Capra movies, especially like It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy mm-hmm. Stewart. And we were like, oh, that that kind of um, it, it was it was called Frank Capricorn was the the term for Frank Capra movies, which are always like these super earnest and the world is so full of hope these positive yeah. uplifting movies and we're like that is the soul of this and so we kind of merged those two characters um inspirations and found <laughs> ethical bug as we called him um which uh <laughs> was a a fun combination for sure oh it absolutely was i i i didn't know how to to feel because it <laughs> I never read that that I don't what was it what are those considered not lullabies um shit what are they called oh, man? Like the nursery fairy rhymes. tales nursery rhymes thank you so yeah. I never really knew the the Jack Horner one I, you know everybody knows Goldilocks and the Three Bears man um but it was seeing him I was like dude this is this is another guy that's just evil to be evil you know he had a sad backstory you know Pinocchio kind of outshine you know outshone him shown him shined him outshined him um yeah. You know, and that's why his motivation for hating fairy tale creatures, man. Um, now, the 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 whole breakdown with him, where he's in his mansion, or he's in his bakery, excuse me, and he's literally just taking every magical device oh, he yeah. could possibly do. I thought that was so cool. And then you get to see what unicorn horns really do to people, which I thought was really fun. And then just the the fact that he had no care for his baker's dozen getting down there and he's like oh you don't like to talk do you and he's like no i don't okay you can come with me. i'll save you because you're not going to talk to me you just see how much of an ass this guy really is and just how evil he re- and, and when you think about it i was like Dude, he's more evil than the wolf was the wolf was just doing what he what a wolf does he was death goldie was just misguided this guy is just pure. he's just a dick that's all he, yeah. that's all you could really say you know and i thought and i thought he played a so really fun. good yeah you know it's it's from his from his horrible haircut to the you know to just his look i just thought he was a fun character and like i said going back to my previous point how you guys were able to take four i mean if you want to take kitty and puss as two separate ones and then you take the other three i mean you guys got five stories woven into one i mean at any point this movie could have fell apart just because of how much stuff you guys had out there but how you tied everything in and gave everybody their moment and everybody a finish i think it's second to none i'm not just blowing smoke here i i think you guys set out to do something very, very special. And I think you guys, I want to make sure I say this correctly. Don't say it. You, you over delivered in the best possible way. Like, like I said, there's so many times you guys could have dropped the ball and every character's story finished, but also continued. Cause like, I wonder what happened to them. I want to see what they're going to do next. Like, I want to see what happens to Goldie and the three bears. I'd like to see, you know, I guess Jack's kind of dead, but it's a movie with movie magic. Anybody can come back, you know, I'd like to see, yeah, I'd like to see yeah. Kitty and, and, and I want to see a Pedro movie so bad. He was such a fun character. You guys bleeping out the explicit expletives in, in his, when he was talking about his names and then you get that sad story, but it's, it's him thinking it's a joke of his litter mates and everything. They threw a rock and a sock and they threw it out there and how he could always look at the positive side like i got this new sweater i grew into it i got this new sweater and i got a cool story and then you see kitty saw she's like no that's a that's a sad that's a sad story that's there's nothing to be funny about that you know i just thought it was like i said so well done man um but speaking on Pedro for just a little while uh how fun of a character was he to play around with oh i mean he, he actually honestly he was a tough one to find um, really yeah he was for and like I said, we, we made this movie pretty quickly, but even our first passes, I think before Harvey Guillen, you know, came in and voiced him, um, well, in just us writing him, he was he he was the chatty sidekick. Mm-hmm. And he was so annoying. <laughs> it was <laughs> which I mean, because it's such a we we're like, oh, it's like Scrappy Doo, you know, like the Scooby Doo mini guy. Um, I like Scrappy Doo though. <laughs> I know he gets a lot of hate, but I like Scrappy. <laughs> I know you're right. That becomes like a derivative thing, but but it was like how did like he it it's the I think um especially in knowing like Puss in Boots is I mean Antonio Banderas is so funny voicing Puss in Boots. Yeah. I mean, and and I mean the, the the cast we have is amazing. We didn't need another comedic character, and I think as long as as 
as soon as we discovered, like you said it, like uh, Perito is the soul of the movie. He's not a sidekick. He's the one who carries this big mm -hmm. old theme <laughs> about how special life is if you have someone yes. to share it with and if you appreciate what's right in front of you. And um, then it, it kind of unlocked like, oh, we can, we can just by contrast, this guy has a sunshiny rainbows kind of point of view of life. And you've got all these cynical, you know, <laughs> criminals that surround him. The comedy comes from that contrast and his sincerity. And mm -hmm. then we, and with everything, we love just delving into the reality of characters. And, and we are like, he's a, a, a street dog, right? He, he's a mutt. He has, he has no home and he, no name. Um, and by the way, that was uh, inspired by the uh, the man with no name, uh, kind really? of good, the ugly. Or again, just for our own like, oh, it's so fun to have these uh, spaghetti western like uh, little homages in there. But um, he was this character that um, when we followed like the truth of him, is like this guy is has been called all kinds of things. He, yeah. He probably doesn't understand most of the things he's repeating. So when he's cursing people out, he doesn't know what they're what they actually mean. And so there's this innocence still. And um, I think one of the things that whether it was with comedy or uh, with drama in this, we wanted to kind of continue the legacy of Shrek, mm -hmm. which when that first Shrek movie came out, it was a game changer where it was pushing the envelope. Uh, especially taking on a lot of the the Disney stereotypes yes. and parodying them, and that the humor was was really edgy. It was for adults, mm -hmm. and that was so unique at the time. And for us, we kind of gave ourselves permission to continue pushing. Uh, you know, with the comedy, we're like, oh, I guess we're bleeping because we can't say those yeah. things, <laughs> but we sure want to make sure you get across that this kind of edginess of this dog who's been on the streets. Um, and then scary moments is like going, oh, we can dip into a new expansion of the tale kind of feel, but, um, that, that it's a uh, grim mm -hmm. as well. And you can go dark. Um, so I think that was like the fun, um, evolution of Perito and then when Harvey again come in, came in I mean we love him and what we do in the shadows and yeah. Harvey is just the sweetest guy and really was willing to play and he just and he has this this like really optimistic uh genuine point of view that we just said we just want you <laughs> to to voice this character we don't need like it to be cartoony because it's just there's a a genuine goodness in in Harvey, um, and so that was one of the cool things seeing that kind of come together in the movie. Yeah, uh, like I said, these these characters were so fun, and like I said, each character could probably have a spinoff movie. Like if I had, like I said, if I had billions of dollars to throw at this franchise, everybody <laughs> gets a solo series to just spin out of, man. Um, especially Pedro, because I, I had so f from the time he gets introduced and he's dressed up like a cat, you're like. I like this guy. He's got moxie, man. He's he's trying to do whatever he can. He's a survivor, essentially. He's going to do whatever he can to survive. And then you start to see his just fun-loving nature from the time that they get just ousted out of the window from Jack Horner's bakery to him saying, I found a sandwich. I'm like, dude, where'd you find a street sandwich? That type of thing. It's like, it's so fun seeing him play with the other characters. And like, he's, like you said, just seeing him not understand like the severity of the other characters that the characters are coming from a very damaged and that a very pessimistic way of life and he's coming from all optimism and then you see those lines kind of blur like i said i, I just thought it was very fun and a lot of fun with these characters a lot of fun with the storyline um as we start to kind of wind down on on puss and boost's last wish i'm pretty sure you've been asked and any media junket you've had you know what's your favorite scene yada 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 all those things but Taken away from that favorite scene type of thing, what scene in this entire movie, or if there's one or two that you can point to, do you think encapsulates the entire Puss and Boots Last Wish? Is there one or two that stick out the most to you? So there's there's 
yeah, it's hard to sum them down, but the, so let me, there's one that I, I love the way it came together. Um, you kind of, when you follow, when you're like, follow what's the theme of the movie and you're honest with the characters, you end up with sometimes like these happy accidents. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the scenes where, you know, we start the movie, Puss is living the life of a rock star, partying, yeah. right? Every bright colors and everything. Um, in the middle of the movie, we call the scene the fistful of characters. Um, mm -hmm. All the movie, all the, the scene name, names have these kind of geeky uh, spaghetti western, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> just for our own self. Um, so fistful of characters when Jack Horner was was shooting uh, unicorn horns, trying to hit Puss in Boots, <laughs> right? But blowing up his own men, turning them into yeah. confetti. Um, one of my favorite shots, uh, because it actually sums up Puss's journey is when Puss, it goes into bullet time and you're on the back of Puss and his hair is standing up mm -hmm. um, and there's there's a baker who's just exploded. So you have confetti, colorful party in front of Puss in Boots and the camera rotates around and behind Puss, it, it's when he's hearing that wolf whistle. Yeah. Realizing the wolf followed him into this dark forest and so within the same shot, you have a party in front of Puss and Boots, the life he's been living, you rotate around and behind him is death hot on his heels. Mm -hmm. And even we worked into the, into the environment, it looks like a skull within where, where the, the wolf is standing. We love mm -hmm. like just any kind of subtle, <laughs> oh, like the, these motifs. Um, but so that one feel like it sums up like really in one shot, Puss's journey. Um, the then at the very end, when Puss, when the wolf is walking away and it's his profile, um, very inspired by Kurosawa kind of samurai moments, where the wolf is said, "Live your life, live it well," yeah. and he's walking away and it's this wide shot and and um, you know it's it just it there's this fire, this pink fire surrounding Puss and. Mm -hmm death has given him another chance and um to me that that's i love those two shots and then one that just one last one um puss kitty and perito sitting under the stars mm -hmm. and, and looking up and um it just that that moment of them kind of becoming this found family is like really you know, you have very few moments as a filmmaker that actually emotionally touch you because you get so callous because you see these shots so many yes. times. And I remember just seeing that that moment and going, oh, I feel <laughs> like <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I'm not dead inside. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, it, but, um, you know, uh, the, the wonderful thing about like the, the way this movie turned out is like every frame of this movie looks a thousand times better than I pictured it because it wasn't just me making it. It was a whole journey of, of our entire crew bringing everything that they had and really, um, you know, putting all their blood, sweat and tears into every frame and even into the honesty of, of what the story is. And I, I, I feel like that's what people have been really been reacting to. It was, it was a group of people that made this movie. It, it really was. And you guys, man, it takes, I've said it so many times. It's probably, probably a little douchey, but man, like it, like in a same sense, it takes a village to raise a child, man. It really takes a village to raise the animation from boards or initial concept to the movie that we got to see on the big screen or on our TVs on a regular basis. Um, you know, as we, like I said, as we start to wind down, there is a couple questions I like to ask towards the end of all of these. Uh, and this one I, I always find very fun because it's never the same answer either way. But what was it like seeing your name? You went from head of story on Trolls. You know, uh, you were you started. You said you started out at DreamWorks 18 years ago. So you've literally had a hand in almost everything DreamWorks has put out over the last 18 years. So what was it like seeing your name and then by that name instead of saying head of story or boarded by or edited by what was it like seeing director and then your name scrolling underneath that for the first time <laughs> yeah it's it's surreal um the <laughs> i think the first time i saw directed it was on the holiday special 
that I directed for the the, the Trolls Holiday, which mm -hmm. I had just the most fun being had a story on Trolls because that that movie is just pure joy, yes. and and like I, that's for me. Like every movie doesn't have to be a heavy kind of you know conversation with big heavy themes. It just has to be honest, and then that mm -hmm. one is just like the happiness is contagious, and so proud of that. And on the I remember seeing my name like it directed by, and I I could be mistaken, but I think it's at the opening they do the credits on the holiday special, and Guy Diamond, um, they're on the the bus and mm -hmm. they're they're singing, and Guy Diamond has dropped into uh, a disco ball, and so I think his ass is right there, shiny, and under it is my name directed by Joel Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> so proud. <laughs> You should uh, be, man. Like, but, like but, I said, uh, yeah, it's it's been a crazy uh, journey. Like, and, and I'm just so grateful. I didn't I didn't set out to be a director. I just love drawing, love telling stories, and um, so even that part of the ride was a surprise to me. And so every day, I'm just grateful. I'm like, I get to do this. I get to tell stories. It's amazing. See, that's what, ladies and gentlemen, that's what you need to focus on right there. I've, I've brought this up so many different times on all of these podcasts. I've recorded probably close to 170 podcasts, give or take. You know, we're on like 142 is what drops this week. You know, so there's that whole adage that we all heard it as a kid, right? If you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Bullshit, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, bullshit. I cook for a living. So one thing I, I really want to echo home here is one, I hope my, my youngest son, Cooper, he doesn't think I'm the chef from trolls because my my friends they they all call me they all call me chef and i'm like oh my god please 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 don't let him equate me to what she was doing um in, in, in trolls eating all the trolls because he comes in and he cooks with me we've got him a little plate cook Aww. set he loves he loves doing all of that stuff and sometimes like i burnt myself three times a day like because i got him in one arm he's like 26 27 pounds now i'm sitting here i'm trying to pull stuff out of the oven with one hand i'm trying to flip stuff in the hand you know with the pan so uh you know it, it's it's fun seeing him come in the kitchen with me but it's also like i said I, i'm hoping that he can disassociate what she does and what i do for a living and uh, not me put put me in that same category, um, but uh, that movie in <laughs> itself, uh, like I said, go, going back to that point, uh, you never work a day in your life if you love what you do. It's bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hard days I can imagine you've had from head of story to writing to directing to anything you've done in between. Guarantee it's hard days. But if you could sit there and freeze frame how happy he was when he was talking about butt cheeks and sprinkling in some split uh, and some <laughs> glitter, excuse me, and seeing that name pop across. That's what everybody shoots for right there. If you can find the reason you fell in love with whatever you're doing in the hardest of days, you've got a job you like, man. And that's the only thing that I can tell everybody. If you find something that you like, you're going to have hard days. Keep at it because there are good days and hard days. There are good days and bad days. Um, the good tend to outweigh the bad, man. And, and when we can tell we can tell a movie's going to be good because of your enthusiasm and your joy for what you're doing. You can, as douchey as it sounds, you can taste when somebody hates what they're doing when you're cooking. You can hate, you can you can see it on the screen when you guys don't like it or you guys are just phoning in or you guys are just trying to cash in another dollar. I mean, we can see that as an audience. And these two movies that I talked about, just a little bit, Trolls and, and Puss in Boots, man, it's nothing but fun. Like, when I first started watching Trolls, I'm like, oh my God, this movie again? And mainly it was because I was sitting there. I wasn't really watching it. I was looking at anything else around the room so I didn't have to watch it. And then I started catching on. I'm like, oh, these tunes are catchy. And then I started realizing, I'm like, is that Justin Timberlake? And Katie, my wife, she's like, yeah. I was like, dude, this is like, I'm already a JT fan because I grew up on NSYNC as a kid. I was like, I love Justin Timberlake. And then the music <laughs> catches you. And then you start seeing some of these funny scenes. I mean, this is where Trolls turned around for me. And it was when Branch is and Branch and Poppy are going to the Bergen town and they're at the the tree, right? And then the cloud comes in, sudden death, death, death. And then he was like, Who said that? And the cloud pops out. And then that whole sequence of high fives and and hugs, he's like, All right, let's give it a hug. And then he snaps the twig and then he goes and chases him. And you see the cloud go from smiling to sad. He just pissed himself because he rained and he's being chased by Justin Timberlake with a stick and he's like I'm going to snap your little cloud arms off your little cloud body and beat you with them. That scene stole it in the entire movie. For I love absolutely love that scene. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny cuz the and I I do have to get going um oh, but you know. uh, the 
being his head of story on that, um, I learned so much from the director, uh, Mike Mitchell, and the co-director, Walt Dorn. And the two of them, I mean, they are hilarious together. And they would constantly go, we're thinking of the parents as mm -hmm. long, in addition to the children. And scenes like that where they're just kind of, they're for us. You know, they're they're like yeah. a break from the singing. He's like, for mm -hmm. everybody who who hates all the singing, this is your break. And uh, but you know, so it's like one of those things where um, that the um, King Gristle and Bridget, like they're yes. so weird that you, they're they're kind of like a fun break that invites everybody in. Um, and there's so much joy in it. It was it was an awesome experience. Um, I uh, I do have to go do my other job, which is be a dad. Or actually, oh, sorry, um, be a driver for my son. I, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got to take him somewhere. <laughs> so Absolutely. No problem at all, man. Like I said, Joel, this has been an absolute blast, man. Uh, come back again next time, ladies and gentlemen. He's been Joel. I've been Julian. It's been a What's in My Head podcast. And this has been another piece of your childhood. Good night.